Salve te discipuli, mihi nomen est magister seers. Today we want to begin our Latin 2 course, which will start at lesson 21 and following, up to lesson about 47. Today, though, we're going to do a review before we start with that of our Latin 1 curriculum, lessons 1 through 20 in the Oxford Latin course. So this is why I've written the word review up here. What have we learned so far in chapters 1 through 20? Well, we've learned there are five declensions referring mainly to the noun, the five declensions of the noun. For example, puella is a noun of the first declension, and we can tell the declension of a noun by its genitive singular ending. Puella, puellae. A-E tells me that it is a noun of the first declension. I, that is the genitive singular ending of any first declension noun. The second declension, let's take an example here, servus, servi, and I know it's second declension because of the final I. All second declension nouns have an I on the genitive singular ending. The genitive singular is always included in any vocabulary list of Latin nouns. You have that on your complete vocabulary chart, which is on the course site. Okay, third declension, let's take orbs, orbis. Third declension noun, obviously, because of the is ending on the genitive singular. That tells me that it's a third declension noun. It also gives me the root of this noun, urb. This is what the endings of the third declension will be added to. Orbs, orbis, orbi, orbem, orbe. Orbes, orbium, orbibus, orbes, orbibus. And this is an I stem noun of the third declension. Go back in your book and it'll explain what I stem nouns are. It's basically when it has the uh, when it, orbs, orbis, when it has the single uh, syllable there, when it goes into the genitive. I'll, I'll review that again in another chapter on third declension I stem nouns. But it is in the back of your Latin one book under the third declension and those little side things tells you all about I stem nouns. Fourth declension, let's take um, manus. Manus, the word for hand. Okay, I know that's a fourth declension noun because of the US. You just learned the fourth declension toward the end in chapters uh, 19 and 20. They're manus, manus. I know that's a fourth declension noun because the genitive ends in U.S. Only a fourth declension noun would be like that. And then the fifth declension, let's take the word for hope, because we always want to have hope. Spes, spei. And I know this is a fifth declension noun because of the E-I there. I take that off and I've got my, my stem, which would just be S-P there. Spes, spei, spei, spem, spei. Spes sperum, spabus, spes spabus, the fifth declension. So there's the five declensions. As you can see, most nouns, or as, you, as you've experienced already, most nouns are in the first three declensions. Very few are in declensions four and five. What also has declensions adjectives do? There are two types of adjectives we've learned. We have learned first and second declension adjectives, like uh, the adjective altus, alta, and altum, it takes on the endings of the first and second declension to decline, or excuse me, to describe any noun in the Latin language. For example, the tall girl, alta puella, or puella alta. The tall slave, altus servus. And let's use it of uh, the high temple, altum. Templum. You also have third declension adjectives, which obviously take on the endings of the third declension. Let's take the word fortis, which means brave. Fortis forte. And it, you look in the back of your book in your charts. The back of the book, uh, back of any Latin book, contains charts of all the information that you need to know, whether it's pronouns or adjectives or nouns or verbs. Charts on top of charts. But it all makes it sensible, all makes it very logical. So here we have a third declension adjective. It can describe any noun in the Latin language, any noun. 
If it's describing a third declension noun, however, the endings will probably look the same. For example, the, um, let's take the genitive of, of the brave soldier, because fortis means brave. We want to say of the brave soldier. Of the brave soldier, that's genitive. Anytime I see of in Latin, in English, excuse me, uh, we're going to have a genitive case here. So that would be fortis, that's the genitive of the third declension, militis. Fortis militis, of the brave soldier. Okay? See the same ending? Is and is there. What else have we learned in Latin? Well, we've learned a lot about the verb. Okay, lots and lots about the verb. Okay, so let me give you a quick swipe here. And let's get into the verb. And as soon as we finish this and a couple of things about prepositions, we'll move right into chapter 21. Okay, the verb we've learned has tenses. Tenses means time, when the action occurred. So we have present tense, which we, uh, which we were dealing with for most of the course, right up until Christmas. And then we have imperfect tense, which we dealt with just before Christmas. Then we have perfect tense, which we dealt with before Christmas in chapter 17 and chapter 18, if you remember. Then in chapters 19 and 20, we get into the pluperfect tense. And uh, later on in Latin too, we will evolve, develop into the future perfect tense, which will be the last of them. There are six tenses, present, imperfect, perfect, pluperfect, future, and future perfect. In a few chapters, we will pick up on the future and future perfect. You will want to know those for your national Latin exam, especially the future, not necessarily the future perfect. Okay, the present tense is time going on now. Okay, I love, I do love, I am loving. So there's three translations that we use in English. I love, I do love, I am loving. And we know that the present stem, let's take the verb to love, amo, erase that A there, that's the stem, not the first one. I'm putting now the principal parts of the verb here. Amo, amare, amawi, and amatum. That's four principal parts. One, two, three, and four. All Latin verbs have these principal parts, these four principal parts, and we use them. Okay, let's just cut here. Cameraman. Okay, continuing our discussion of the principal parts here, we need principal parts of the verb in any language. In English, today I sing, yesterday I sang, all week long I have sung. Latin, the same thing. We use the principal parts to get the stems that we need to go into these tenses. So if I want to say, I love, then I have to go to this tense here. In fact, let me use the third person rather than the first person so we don't have to talk about exceptions. Let's put he loves here, third person singular. I need to get my present stem from the second principal part here. This is the infinitive. Remember the infinitive? It completes the meanings of certain verbs, I want to go, I need to eat, that kind of thing. So he loves is going to be am telling me that it's third person singular. And the ama here is the present stem, which I borrowed from the second principal part here. The next one, the imperfect, he was loving. Imperfect can be translated several ways. He used to love, he was loving, he loved if in the terms if, if you say he loved in the sense that he did it every day as a condition or a habit, you're in the imperfect tense in English. In Latin, there's no problem because it's going to end in B-A-T. A-M-A-B-A-T. Amabat. So that's the formation of the imperfect tense. Again, it's formed on the present stem. When we learn the future in a few chapters, we're also going to learn the future is formed on the present stem. A-M-A. We get the present stem by cutting off the RE, the infinitive ending, of the second principal part of the verb. I know I'm talking fast, but this is review. This is, this is information you've already been over. So this is just bringing it to mind again. Then uh, we'll skip the future because we're going to get that later on. In the perfect, he did love. Perfect tense in English, you can say he has loved, he did loved, he loved. 
And for this, we need to go to our perfect stem, which we get in the third principal part. There will always be an I here, even on irregular verbs. We cut that I off, and there's our perfect stem, A-M, A-V. And then you, were, you needed to memorize the endings of the perfect tense, E, isti, it, imus, istis, erin. So the third principal part, excuse me, the third person is going to end in I-T, amawit. So he did love, amawit. Where did I get the A-M-A-V from? The third principal part of the verb. Where did I get these principal parts from? From a dictionary. And you, sh you should memorize the principal parts of the most common verbs in your book. That's what your flashcards are for. This last principal part here is called a supine. You don't have to remember that now. But later on, when we study the passive of the perfect system, we will be talking about the supine or the last principal part of the verb. Right now, you don't have to worry about that. But that's what it, it, it does have a function. It's not just hanging on here. This has a function, too. The first principal part is simply to look up the word in a dictionary. And you, can, you, you might have a paperback dictionary. You might want to use an online dictionary. There's no reason why you can't look up a Latin word. Okay, then pluperfect tense. Again, he did love. This is an, a past action that precedes another past action. Before I ate breakfast, I had brushed my teeth. So in English, we translate, the, excuse me, I made a mistake here. I need to put did, or excuse me, uh, had. He had loved. There we are. Now we're in the pluperfect. Pluperfect plus quam perfectum, perfectum means that you have an action in the past preceding another past action. Okay, and this in Latin, we go to our perfect stem, A-M-A-V. I get it right here from my third principal part, the same as I did for the perfect tense. But instead of adding E, isti, it, emus, istis, errant, like I did in the perfect, I'm going to add erram, erras, errat. Erramus, erratis, errant. That is the imperfect of the verb to be. The verb to be is the first verb that you learned in Latin. And you should have memorized all the forms of the verb to be. The present tense, sum, s, est, sumus, estis, sunt, sunt, just like you do for any other language. If you were doing French, je suis tu a il a, nous sommes vous êtes ils sont. No matter what language you take, you're going to have to learn the present, imperfect, the different tenses of the verb to be. The imperfect is erram, erras, errat, erramus, erratis, erran. That's the imperfect. I was, you were, he was. We were, y'all were, they were. I say y'all were to distinguish it from the second person singular. The future of the verb to be erro, eris, erit, erimus, eritis, errant. And you'll learn that when we get into the future. Uh, you've already seen a little bit. Uh, remember that uh, picture of the skeleton I had up there? Uh, that it, it said, uh, this is what you will be someday. Uh, where it said, uh, um, um, sum quid eris. There it is. Sum quid eris. I am what you will be. The eris there is the, th is the future of the verb to be. Then, with, uh, after this, we would get the future perfect, and I'll involve myself in that in a later lesson in the book. So there's the review of the verb, very quick review. That's not everything we learned about the verb, but it's the, it's the main portion of what we learned concerning the verb. Okay, there's also prepositional phrases that we've gone over, and you've learned that a preposition can take two cases. Here's the preposition. And it can take either an accusative case or an ablative case. In fact, the ablative is mainly used 90% of the time just for prepositions. So if I say, out of the field, ex agro, I want an ablative case there after this preposition. This preposition takes an ablative. How did I know that? I memorized it. When you come, uh, when you come into a new preposition, you always have to memorize the case that it governs along with what it means. Ex agro. Let's say um, he is near the house. Prope, prope casam. Takes the accusative, obviously, because you have an accusative ending there. Prope casam, that's a prepositional phrase in Latin. A preposition and its object. And you learn these mainly through reading. Since these, this preposition will always take an accusative case, this preposition will always take an ablative case. That as you keep reading and reading and reading, it will fall into place as something natural. You expect it. 
you expect that that's the easiest way to learn Latin is simply to keep reading Latin. It's the way I learned to read German. You just keep reading German. So the, the, you just do it. Okay? So get, that's called total immersion. Just get used to it. That's how you learn English. You just kept repetition is the mother of learning. Repetitio est mater studiorum. Okay, so that winds up our review except for one other item, and that is the pronoun. The pronoun, and you know there's a lot of different kinds of pronouns. There is a personal pronoun. Okay, the personal pronoun, like ego, referring to your, the first person. The uh, nos, we, vos, you. And this ha these are declined. Ego, mei, mihi, mei, mei. You have to memorize the declension of these pronouns. These are personal pronouns. We have demonstrative pronouns that point things out, this and that. Demonstrative. Hic and ille. And again, you'll find charts for that in the back of the book. These are demonstrative. Demonstro in Latin means to point something out. Okay? This is a, a tabula blanca. A whiteboard here. Okay, then you have, uh, besides demonstrative, you would have a pronoun called the relative pronoun. And you'll see more about the relative pronoun in Latin too. In Latin 1, we, that back of the book is so important, the grammar index, you just have to keep thumbing back there. Or there's there's grammar, uh, grammar online also. The relative pronoun, very common in English, we use it all the time. It forms a relative clause, which is a dependent uh, clause. Okay, here, here's an example. The boy who sits in the chair is very, well, I won't use very because we haven't had the superlative yet. We'll just put, say, quiet. In the chair. is very, well, I won't use very because we haven't had the superlative yet. We'll just put, say, quiet. The boy who sits in the chair is quiet. Here's your relative pronoun, folks, who. This is a relative clause, who sits in the chair. It's a dependent clause because it cannot stand by itself in a sentence. Remember, you're learning English grammar right here along with Latin grammar. Who sits in the chair. This is called the antecedent of the relative. A relative pronoun needs an antecedent. Now, if you were skipping school in, uh, in eighth grade the day that the teacher went over this, an antecedent is the noun, and it is a noun, which this pronoun takes the place of. But here's something peculiar to Latin, you might say, because we have declensions and agree more, agreement is more important in Latin than English. Although we do have issues who and whom in English, just like we would in Latin. And of course, once you know the rule for Latin, it applies for English. All right, here's the rule. Here's the rule, and we went over this before. The relative pronoun, doesn't matter who it refers to, agrees in number and case with its antecedent. So number and case, excuse me, number and gender agrees in number and gender with its antecedent, but its case is dependent on its use in its own clause. So let's talk about that for just a moment here. Let's put this in Latin. The word for boy is puer. Okay, the boy who? Well, who here is the subject of the verb sits? So it has to be nominative, so puer qui. Qui, let's go over this right now. Qui is nominative because it is the subject of its own clause. It's not nominative because puer is nominative. It, qui is masculine because puer is masculine. And qui is singular because puer is singular. So it agrees with puer in number and gender, but its case is dependent on its use in its own clause. So let's put sits here, sedet, just to finish off our sentence here. It's second, second conjugation verb. Remember conjugations? There's four of them. Uh, the boy who sits in the chair, okay, for chair we'll put uh, cathedra, or cella, you could use cella there. 
this is a Greek word here, in cathedra est tachytus. Okay, tachytus over here would be a predicate adjective which you learned the first week of Latin class. And that about sums things up for what we've learned in this review of chapters 1 through 20. All right, we've gone over the pronoun, the different types of pronouns. There's more pronouns than what I put up here, but these are the most important ones, the ones you'll run into most commonly. So we've talked about the pronoun, we've talked about the tenses of the verb, the principal parts of the verb, we've talked about the five declensions, and there are no more declensions, there's just five, and we have talked about prepositional phrases. Okay, when I come back to see you next, we're going to start in with chapter 21. Gratias. Salvete discipuli. Chapter 21 is all about the fifth declension. There used to be a singing group called the fifth dimension. This is the fifth declension. You don't remember the fifth dimension. Your facilitators do. Anyway, the fifth declension is, going to, is the last declension that you need to learn. And when I learned the fifth declension, the model noun was res. And I was told res is like kind soup. It has 57 meanings, 57 varieties. And it means just thing. There are very few nouns in the fifth declension. Very few. The word for hope, spaz, is one. Da's, the word for day, is one. Although this is a masculine noun in a feminine declension. The fifth declension is feminine. And by the way, those of you who take Spanish, you'll notice it's buenos dias. Even though it's... Um, even though it's uh, 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 what do you it, it, even though in Spanish it uh, it's an exception it stays masculine as it is an exception here in um, uh, in Latin even though it looks like a feminine word in Spanish it is masculine uh, same thing like water el agua it's it has a feminine ending but it's el agua and this is el dia if you're taking Spanish el dia with an accent there. Like El Dia de Gracias, de Gracias, Thanksgiving. Anyway, the fifth declension, nominative, genitive, dative, accusative, ablative. There's your five cases that we learned as we went through Latin 1, chapters 1 through 20. We know that the nominative case is the case of the subject. We know the genitive case is the case of possession of something. Dative is indirect object when you give, show, or tell something to somebody. The to somebody goes in the dative case. Accusative case is the direct object of the verb, the receiver of the action in the sentence, or it could be the object of a preposition which takes the accusative. And then the ablative case has several meanings, most of which are involved with prepositions which take the accusative, or as separation. He went away from Rome. Roma all by itself without a preposition with a long mark, the make crown over the final A, means you're going away from Rome. If you put Rome in the accusative, Romam, without a preposition, then you're going toward it. We do this much like the word home. We never use a preposition when we're going home. We, we don't say, I go to home. Well, the Romans don't say, I go to Rome. They just say, I go Rome. And they put Rome in the accusative. We also use this for, uh, for uh, talking about time, if we're uh, accusative case stretching out time, he, he was sick for three days. Tres dies, for three days. But if he's going to see me uh, on the third day, tertio die, then that's going to be in the ablative. So we have these cases, as we learn in Latin 1, all have functions that they perform in the sentence. Anyway, getting to our fifth declension here, res, re, e. So the e, i is the genitive singular ending. This is what tells me that res is a fifth declension noun. The dative is also the same, re, e, then rem, then re in the ablative singular. And I'm going to make the plural over here, res, rerum. Forgive my writing, but I think you can see this. If you're following along in your book in chapter 21, you can see that what's going on there. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at page 126, right in the middle of the page for the fifth declension, then res here and rebus. This looks a lot like the, fifth, the third declension, doesn't it? Look at the plural here, es and es, and the bus and the bus here, just like the third declension, if you look at that chart. So the, actually the fifth declension looks like a collision, a train wreck, with the, uh, with the uh, third declension 
And uh, there's another third declension ending here, on, and then the M here, like that. And there's the UM, which we see here. So it looks like a, a collision between the fifth and third declension that came up like this. But there's the fifth declension here. Very few words. The word for faith, fides, is a fifth declension noun. Um, not every word, of course, that ends in ES is the th fifth declension, so be careful. Uh, for example, the word for foot, pes. It's pes pedis. That's a third declension noun, not a fifth declension. So be aware of the fifth declension. And when you see these odd endings of abus instead of ebus, you know you've got a fifth declension noun there. Okay? Let's wrap it up with the fifth declension. Gratius bobus ago. Salvete, discipuli. We're ready to take on chapter 22 in your book. And right now I'm looking down here at page 128. And it's telling me about the uses of the ablative case as opposed to the accusative case. And it goes into a lot of print here in your book. But let's, let me make it short for you. As I've explained earlier, and let me erase what's we've got here from chapter 21 on the fifth declension. Okay, basically, if we want to just look at this in general terms, we have the ablative case here, okay, and the accusative case. Okay. We use the ablative case to denote time, specific time. These are some of these aren't all the uses. There's several uses. Uh, we use the accusative case to stretch time out. Let's call it duration of time. Okay. As I said in the last chapter, accusative case trays da's trays da's for three days. But I will see you on the third day, tertio. DA. Notice the ablative case here. Accusative plural, ablative case. Notice there's no preposition. It's just simply the case by in and of itself is telling me that this is specific time, this is time stretched out. You can also do this with distance. I will see you at the third mile. At the third tertio mile. At the third mile. If we're, uh, excuse me. We'll use, we'll use um, at the third, uh, let's, uh, instead of word mile, because there's not an exact mile, passus uh, in Latin, uh, let's uh, on the third, at the third uh, marker, and let's see what we use for marker, meta. And this would be an A here to agree with that. Meta is a marker. So, tertia meta, I will see you at the third marker. And or as opposed to stretching this out, he he went for, he went, uh, he went for, um, I'm going to use a measure, he he went for 20 markers, let's say. So that'd be Wiginti, 20 is not decline here, and then that would be uh, Metis, or we want the, excuse me, we want the accusative plural here, Metas. Okay, for 20 markers. He, he, he rode his horse for 20 markers, Wiginti Metas. You see the point, though, when you stretch things out, whether it's time or distance, you're, you're in the accusative case. When you're specific, you're in the ablative case. And this, uh, this goes for nouns just being in the case, as I told you before, if you're going towards the name of a city, then it's going to, or I need to put this over here, Romam. If you're going towards it, it's in the accusative case just like you go to, to home. If you're going away from Rome, it's in the ablative case. It has that long mark or macron on the final A there. Okay, so that about sums up page 128 in your book, where it's giving you all of these different directions on the, uh, of what the accusative and the ablative are used for. There's also, and what we've been using all year, is an accusative of exclamation. When you say happy birthday, Merry Christmas, accusative case, happy new year, it's called the accusative of exclamation. And they just keep it in the accusative case. When we say uh, Lightum Natalum Christi, happy birthday of Christ, that's Merry Christmas. We're using Lightum Natalem. You can hear the M, the accusative ending there on the third declension noun. Okay, 
So let's, uh, we, that's really all there is to know in general about page 128, uh, chapter 22. Multas gratis vobis tibi.